Okay, so the next thing we are going to do in this lecture is to bring all these concepts together to form the hidden Markov model. We'll start with a diagram, which is in a non-graphical model form, since I think this might be a bit more intuitive. However, I think they both provide insight into how the model works, it's just insight from a different perspective. To remind you, in this non-graphical model form, this means that each state will be explicitly shown and each edge is the probability of going from one state to another. So let's say we have three hidden states. They are healthy, sick, and allergies. Sick means you have a cold, and allergies means you are suffering from seasonal allergies. Let's suppose these are hidden, which makes sense, since sometimes you might have a runny nose, but you can't figure out the exact cause. Maybe it's allergies, or maybe it's because you have a cold, or maybe for some other unknown reason, but you are otherwise healthy. Now, just to make this interesting, let's make the runny nose a continuous variable to be some measure of how runny your nose is. For example, it could be the volume of mucus that you eject from your nose on that day. We can model that with a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so first, let's consider the parameters of these Gaussian distributions. If we look at the healthy case, we can see that it's a Gaussian with mean 10 and variance 10. As a side note, I'm just making these numbers up, so don't try to look them up in a science journal. They only make sense relative to each other. In the sick case, we can see that it's a Gaussian with mean 60 and variance 50. This makes sense because when you're sick, you should expect to have a runny nose, which means more mucus. Finally, in the allergies case, we have a Gaussian with mean 80 and variance 50. This means that, on average, allergies give you more of a runny nose than having a cold. Also, notice that I'm sticking to the convention that the observations are represented with the variable x and the hidden states are represented with the variable z. Okay, so now let's look at the hidden states. For the hidden states, we can see the probability that we go from one hidden state to another. If we are healthy, then there is a 99% chance that we will be healthy tomorrow. There is also a 0.9% chance that we will have allergies tomorrow, and a 0.1% chance that we will have a cold tomorrow. On the other hand, if we are in the allergy state, we have a 97% chance of still having allergies tomorrow, while we have a 2.9% chance of going back to healthy, and a 0.1% chance of catching a cold. This makes sense because when you have seasonal allergies, it lasts for the whole season. That is to say, if you have allergies today, then it's pretty likely that tomorrow is still part of allergy season. Finally, if we have a cold, then we have an 80% chance of still having a cold tomorrow, a 19% chance of being healthy tomorrow, and a 1% chance of having allergies tomorrow. One feature of this diagram that I want you to notice is that, similar to the plain Markov model, we can see that every node depends only on one other node. That is to say, the amount of runny nose you have, meaning each of the three Gaussians, depends only on the state that you are in today. In other words, if you are healthy today, then we must sample the runny nose amount from the healthy Gaussian. If we have allergies today, then we must sample the runny nose amount from the allergies Gaussian. Okay, so going back to graphical models, here's another way to look at the HMM. In this view, we can see the time dependencies explicitly. Notice how each hidden state z now has a time index, and each observation x also has a time index. Also notice that now, each state variable encapsulates all the values of that state, so we are not explicitly showing healthy sick and allergies. Instead, this is implicit in one symbol, z of t. Next, notice how each of these variables are related. This will help you understand why the model is Markov. We can see that each z depends only on one variable, the past z. That is, z2 depends only on z1, z3 depends only on z2, and so forth. So whether I am healthy today depends only on whether I was healthy yesterday, but not on two days before or three days before. Furthermore, notice how the relationship between the observations and the hidden states is also Markov x at time t depends only on z at time t. That is to say, my amount of runny nose does not depend on whether I was healthy or sick yesterday or tomorrow. 
Of course, logically that makes sense. The amount of runny nose I have today is dependent on my state of health today. Furthermore, notice that x of t does not depend on any other x's. You might assume that the amount of runny nose I have today might depend on the amount of runny nose I had yesterday. But this graphical model shows us that, under the HMM modeling assumptions, this is not the case. Okay, so why did we discuss all of this, and what does this have to do with modeling stock returns? Well, now we can use the same graphical model, but just replace the variables. Now, instead of the hidden variable being the state of health, now it will represent some kind of state of the economy, which we will call the financial regime. Regime is a financial term that essentially means state. We can think of it as the state of the market, or state of the economy, or something like that. I don't want to be too formal in this course. Typically, we can talk about the high volatility regime and the low volatility regime. There are other characteristic behaviors inside these regimes too, but the amount of volatility is the most fundamental. Okay, so the hidden state now represents the regime, and there are two values for this state, low and high volatility. Then, the observations that we make are the returns or log returns on an asset. Now, we can also use a Gaussian distribution to represent these returns. So why does using a Gaussian make sense now, when previously we saw that it failed to model stock returns accurately? Going back to our non-graphical model, we can see why this makes sense. When we are in a low volatility regime, the return is sampled from a Gaussian with low variance. When we are in a high volatility regime, the return is sampled from a Gaussian with high variance. So why are we now allowed to use a Gaussian to represent the return at distribution? Remember that the return at distribution only looks fat-tailed because we ignored time. That is to say, we looked at the histogram of all returns, assuming they came from the same single distribution. But then, we realized that, if we used a Gaussian mixture, we could more accurately model the return distribution by assuming that some returns came from one Gaussian and other returns came from the second Gaussian. That means on some days, the returns were sampled from one Gaussian, and on other days, the returns were sampled from the other Gaussian. However, there was still no time dependence in that model. We were just randomly flipping coins to decide which Gaussian to sample from. With the hidden Markov model, what we are saying now is that we are still sampling from two different Gaussians, but there is structure in how we choose these Gaussians. So let's go back to our graphical model. Previously, when we looked at the GMM, the Z variable was an independent biased coin toss. That is, we were flipping a biased coin to choose either the fat Gaussian or the skinny Gaussian. But each time we flipped that coin, the result was not dependent on past coin flips. Now, with the HMM, what we are saying is that we are still flipping this biased coin, but the coin flips are not independent. Instead, the result of each coin flip depends on which regime I was in previously. And so, hopefully that makes sense in terms of volatility clustering. We know that, if we are in a regime with high volatility, then there is a high probability that we will stay there. If we are in a regime with low volatility, then there is a high probability that we will stay there. In other words, those coin flips are not independent like in a GMM, but they are more like an HMM, where each coin flip depends on the last state. So I just realized that the title of this lecture is Why Sequence Models, but as of right now, we haven't actually answered this question explicitly. But I hope that, given what we just discussed, the answer is clear. We want to model the sequential nature of regime switching because we know that volatility clustering exists. The GMM was able to model stock returns when we assumed stationarity, but we know that a non-stationary model is more accurate. Furthermore, because a mixture of Gaussians leads to a fat tail distribution, if we were to look at the stock returns sampled from an HMM, after throwing away the time dependence, we would again get back a fat tail GMM. 
In other words, the HMM is just a more general model. It not only models the sequential dependencies of stock returns, but it still models the fat tailedness of the GMM. To understand this more clearly, we can use what is called plate notation. In plate notation, we can express repeated samples. That is, for the GMM, we explicitly state the time dependence. So instead of just z, we say z of t, and instead of just x, we say x of t. In the corner, we say that little t goes from 1 up to big T. Now, we can compare the GMM and the HMM more directly, since now both graphical models have a time index. So here's the difference. It says that, for the GMM, each z of t is a coin toss, but it's a coin toss that just comes out of nowhere. It does not depend on anything. On the other hand, for the HMM, each z of t is still a coin toss, but it's a coin toss that depends on the result of the last coin toss. So that's the big difference between GMMs and HMMs. With GMMs, our coin tosses are independent. With HMMs, our coin tosses are dependent on the last coin toss, and they form a Markov chain. However, notice that the observation x of t is always dependent on only z of t in both cases, and there is no dependence on any other random variables. To help you understand this further, here's yet another way we can look at this model. Now, instead of using the more compact plate notation, I've expressed each of the z of t's explicitly, showing z1, z2, z3, and so on. So now you can see, the only difference between the HMM and the GMM is that there are no arrows connecting z1 with z2, z2 with z3, and so on.